Yes, ma'am. Um, I know God revealed himself to man through All right. I, all right. Get Psalm 19 in one hand, and get Romans chapter two in the other. Romans chapter two and Psalm 19, and then for a case, uh, we'll take Acts 10. Psalm 19, Acts 10, Romans two. Now the way this thing works is, first of all, in in nature, like she says. There's enough revelation of God so that anybody knows there is God. But the revelation goes far beyond that, because in nature God has revealed not only his uh, personality as Godhead, but he has also revealed both advents in the church age. Uh, Psalm 19.1, the heavens, plural, declare the glory of God. Declare. You see, you declare something, you say it. Down south they say, well, I declare. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Now watch this. Day unto day utters what? Well, all right, every sun, sunrise to sunset speaks. Day unto day utters speech. Every time that sun comes up and goes down, it preaches. And night unto night showeth knowledge. From sun down to sun up, the Lord is trying to get something across. There is no speech, no language, where there what? Voice is not heard. In plenty of words, no matter what language a man knows, 24 hours a day, the Lord is preaching at him. And the Lord is preaching at him in a language he understands. And there isn't any nation doesn't hear the voice. They all hear it. All right, for their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words, words, night and day speak and preach words, W-R-D-S, words to the end of the world. When Paul says the gospel preached to every creature under heaven over there in Colossians chapter 1, that's what he's talking about. There's a sense in which any man has knowledge of it, he just looks up over his head. Now, it goes much further than that. You take that thing day in a day out of his speech. You ever stop thinking about what that thing is? Now, the sun comes up. Where does the sun come up? Over here? Back over here. This is east and west. I get turn every time I come up here. I keep thinking that's north up there. Across Cincinnati's over there, huh? Isn't that over here? Well, that couldn't be east there, then. East be oh, that's what the trouble is. I keep thinking you're on the other side of the river looking across to it. <laughs> okay, let's see. North? No. West here, east here. North out over here. That's right. Okay. I keep thinking about that. When you, when, what, when you, when you stand facing north, uh, what, I have, what do you have in your right hand? Fingers. <laughs> so you have north, south, east, and west. All right, that sun comes up there in the east in the morning, sets in the west in the evening. All right, now look at here. When it goes down west and dies over there, it's blood red when it goes down. It's blood red. There isn't any heat in the world that doesn't know that when Christ came, he died on the cross and was buried. It goes down blood red when it goes down. Now these scientists can talk about dust particles, the atmosphere, and all this junk. But the fact remains, it goes down blood red. You still don't know the Son is Christ. I won't work either. Everybody in the world who is not a Christian winds up eventually in some form of sun worship. If you went to the Roman Catholic Church, you'd find a big old solar disk right in the middle of the altar. And if you knelt the altar, they give you a little old round disk just about that size. It's like a little flying saucer. <laughs> Put in your mouth. <laughs> and that priest got up there, he'd have a circular cut around here. You know, this collar, that'd be a perfect circle. Sun worship. You know why that is? Because all the light and heat and energy in this world comes from the sun. If you were just a heathen, suppose you knew nothing, and you grew up and knew there was a God, and every man knows, I mean, this is the true light that lightens every man that cometh in the world. And you begin to look around and try to find an object of worship, what would you pick? You'd pick the sun. I mean, naturally. You notice when the sun came out, you could see. When it was gone, you couldn't see. You notice when it came out, it helped the flowers and crops grow. And for one the sunshine that didn't grow, you'd get that real quick. You notice it provided you with heat and energy and warmth. And you see every spring, you'd see everything coming back and every winter, everything dying. See, now you get through your head real quick. The main thing was the sun. Now the Bible says in Romans chapter one, the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world 
are clearly seen, being understood the things, those things that are made, so they're without excuse. And it says, the invisible things of the world from the creation are clearly seen, even his eternal power and Godhead. So the Bible says that a man can see the Trinity every day of his life. You see the Trinity, Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, every day. Son dies over there in the west. What does it do in the east in the morning? Comes up again. Comes up. What color does it come up with? Blood red. Isaiah chapter 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozah, a vesture dipped in blood? See? First advent, second advent, every 24 hours for 4,000 years. Night comes. Up comes the moon. Witness at night. What's the moon doing? It's following the sun. Earth's going this way. Sun, moon going that way. Against the world. Are you for Christ? If you're for Christ, you're going against the world. And the world's going against you. Now listen, Christian. If you're not against something, you're against Jesus Christ. You swear to get that wrong. You say, I'm not going to be against anything. You can't stay neutral. If you're on the earth, the earth is turning. Then no such thing as a neutral Christian. No such thing exists. If you're neutral, you're going away from Jesus Christ. 24 hours a day, you go further every time it spins. The only way you can go with the sun is go against the world. That's how that thing goes. Earth goes this way. Now you take that moon. He says in the Song of Solomon, Who is she that shineth forth, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as on with banners? That's a picture of the body of Christ. That sun reflects, that moon reflects the light of the sun. And that moon follows the sun. The church is supposed to follow Christ. If you're in a church that is not going against the world, <laughs> you're not in the Lord's church. So when I belong to a church, but we try to get along with folks, then you're against Jesus Christ. Because the world going this way and the church going that way. You know why they want to get up there and put their dirty feet in that thing? Because it's a picture of the church. And when those fellows stepped out there about ten years back and put their floor shines on that moon, that was the end of a dispensation. Because that was the world defiling the body of Christ. That was a picture of the church taking over the world. Well, a boy got there and put his foot down there, one step for man, one great step for mankind, you know. <laughs> what a gas bag, man. Can you imagine a 30-year Navy man talking that way? Those fellows are Navy men, you know. You know imagine a 30-year 30 30 Navy man saying, one step for man, one giant step for mankind. They don't talk that way. I've known Navy men all my life. They don't talk that way. If you had a tape record, that would have been, I the only thing I've got, you know, pretty good, pretty blankety blank slippery down here. Well, look out for the blanket by my ladder before you put your foot down. How's that? Beats the blanket about it. And that's what I've been. <laughs> One step. Somebody wrote that thing out on a piece of paper and said, hey, boy, memorize this thing. When you get down there and put the thing out. That's a picture of the world taking over the church. All right. Then the heathen, the people who haven't heard, don't know, have innate knowledge of the first advent, the second advent, and the church age, and the trinity. Now, Romans chapter 2, verse 12. This describes how a person is going to be treated that doesn't hear the gospel. And this person here not only doesn't hear the gospel, they don't even have any Bible or any Ten Commandments. Romans 2, 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall perish. They're unsaved. Shall perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Just because a man doesn't have the light of the law or the gospel, that doesn't mean he's saved. He's still lost. You say, why is that? Verse 13, For not the hearer of the law are just before God, but the doer of the law shall be justified. Then back in the Old Testament, there was an old Gentile out there trying to live right and trying to keep the law. God would justify him, and he wouldn't justify a Jew who had the law, who wasn't trying to keep it. Verse 14, For when the Gentiles which have not the law, and it was fell out in the bushes somewhere, never heard the Ten Commandments, never got an Old Testament, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law of themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. When a Gentile out in the bushes does by nature what the law says to do, he tells on himself. You know what he tells about himself? He tells you he knows all Ten Commandments, and the right hand side there, he's just trying to pull your leg. You ever hear a fellow say, well, what about the folks that never heard? 
They may know more about it than you know about it. Now, you know what they do out in Africa in some tribes? When a fellow steals something, you know what they do? They cut off his left hand. You know what they do in the next time he steals? They cut off his right hand. You know what they do if he steals a third time? They kill him. <laughs> now, why? Why? I never had a chance. I didn't know what was right and what was wrong. You did, too. You punished the guy for doing wrong. If you punish him for doing wrong, then you know it's wrong to steal. All these Americans are going to have a time with the judgment. Boy, oh boy, man. Come up there. What do you mean you didn't know? Well, I don't know. You know what I was raised. Didn't I hear you criticizing that preacher for what he did? Yeah. Well, then you must have thought it was wrong, didn't you? Oh, they might know that's wrong. Well, then how come you did wrong and didn't know it? <laughs> but tough stuff. Once you, once you draw a judgment, once you say about somebody else, I don't believe in that, or I don't look at it that way, or that didn't seem right to me, or I wouldn't do that, you've already shown something. You've shown that you yourself have a sense of what's right and what's wrong. Now, once you've shown that, then you sure better live by the lights you have, or you'll be judged by it. You take back in the Old Testament, these people didn't have the law and didn't have the gospel. I'll give you a perfect case. One night Abraham's having some trouble, and he goes down there in the south of Palestine where some of the Hamites are, and a Hamite gets looking over his wife, and she's pretty good to look at. I'm, she was still a fair woman, mad and messing with her when she was 75. She must have been a knockout at 40. <laughs> and so this guy's messed around, and he says, I will take that woman, you know, be my wife. And Abraham says, I'm going to get me in some trouble. If they take her and find she's my wife, they're going to kill me and take her. So he says to his wife, he says, tell you what, he says, they get messing around, you say you're my sister. So Abimelech comes along and starts to, you know, uh, courting Abraham's wife, and she says, I'm his sister. Abimelech thinks, good, it's all right, take her for a queen. So he takes her in the palace and starts making wedding arrangements. About that time, in the middle of the night, the Lord shows up. says, hey, boy, <laughs> what you doing? <laughs> and he says, well, what do you mean, what am I doing? <laughs> and he said, you got another man's wife over there. That woman's married. No, sir, she's the sister. <laughs> No, it's his wife. Well, she told me, and I Lord, don't kill me. I'm innocent. I ain't touched the woman. <laughs> what did he start talking like that for? Why, well, sure, it's a dumb way to talk if you think it's all right. Boy, you think the Lord ain't going to trip up some folks? I mean, if it's right, what's the swell about, boy? I mean, if it's all right, you know, premarital sex, you know, and adult consent, then when the Lord puts it on you, why don't you say, well, I thought it was all right, Lord. What's wrong with that? But you never do, do you? You start now. Now look here, Lord. Now don't be too hurried. Don't be too hasty here. Hold down. <laughs> you know when men start talking like that, you know what they show? They shave the show they know what's wrong. Now, what did Bimelech have? I tell you he had. He had nothing. You know that thing happened? That thing happened back there in Genesis nineteen. Do you know how much Bible was written in the time of Genesis nineteen? None of it. <laughs> you know who wrote Genesis? Moses. Moses wasn't alive in Genesis 19. I'll give you another case. Oh, Jeremiah's out there in the city, and in come Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard. And they're crucifying Jews, you know, and raping the women in the streets and killing the babies and hanging the old men up by the thumbs, and all the kids are making uh, cut wood and haul water, and the city's burning the ground, the temple's being burned to the ground, they're dumping over the rocks and plowing the temple to get the gold, and about that time, Nebuchadnezzar riding and called Jeremiah outside the city and says, Okay, now you can go wherever you want to go. And he said, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and said to Jeremiah, You know, the Lord God said he'd do this, this place, and he done did it. The captain of the guard said that. He didn't have any Bible. He wasn't even a Jew. He was a pagan, heathen. You know what he said? He said, The Lord said he's going to get this place, and he got it. Now, you see, the heathen have a lot more like you think to do. I wouldn't be this surprised the day of judgment. You didn't find a lot of folks in Indian Africa who knew a lot more about the Lord than these college professors do down here at the University of Cincinnati. They're the dumb bunnies. Some of them don't even think the Lord's around. All right, now we'll continue. Romans 2, 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile, accusing, he does it, she does it, or else excusing, we always have done it, a little bit doesn't hurt, know when to quit, one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men but Jesus Christ according to my gospel. 
in plenty of words, we don't know everything that goes on among the heathen, and the day of judgment, the secrets of the heart will be brought out, and God will judge those people according to their conscience apart from the gospel. And you don't know which ones know what or how much they know or how much they don't know. Now let's turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts 10, 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a certain church of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, very religious, one that feared God, with all his house, raised his family right, which gave much alms to the people. He's generous, liberal, and prayed to God always. His fellow's dedicated. Is he saved? How many say he is saved? How many say he's lost? Why, sure. He lost a goose in the horse race. <laughs> and the fellow's devout and fears God and prays and gives on, but he's lost. And he saw in a vision. Well, you can have visions and not be saved. You know what the vision tells him? It says, go get a missionary. And the Lord has to go deal with the missionary. <laughs> and the missionary argues. And the Lord goes to the missionary and says, the fellow down there looking for the truth, go give him the truth. He's following his conscience. The answer to that question is this. When a man who doesn't know the truth follows his conscience to a certain point, at some point in there, the Lord gives the word of truth to him, gives him a chance. Now, as to what point that is, I don't know what that point is. And I don't know whether the fellow follows his conscience all the way or halfway or partway before the Lord gives it to him. That'll come out at the white throne judgment, and only God knows that. But the more and more I deal with people, the more and more I realize there are thousands of Americans that are in this kind of a mess where they follow their conscience and they come to a place, they come to a crossroad where the Lord says, okay, if you want the truth, there it is. And when the guy looks at it, his hair stands on end and the goose pimples come out and he says, oh my God, if I follow that, I can't bear, get buried in the right kind of cemetery. And he backs off. Well, I think there is in the country, I think the thousands are saved Catholics in this country. I really believe that. I think of thousands of them, in spite of all the church did for them. <laughs> I think a lot of them get saved, listen to the radio and watching TV. A lot of them get saved through witness, and they come along there and they get saved. They get that place where, boy, you ought to get out of that mess and get in that book. And when he sees that thing, it puts him into a cold sweat. I'll have to bust off fellowship my mom and my daddy. I'll lose my job down at the plant. And he just rejects the truth and puts it away and stays with the system. So the answer to that is, I don't know what, to what extent they have to follow their conscience before God gets the gospel to them, but if they do, he will get the gospel to them. All right, something else. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a college education.